Hey, it's Brett with Useful Aircraft. I'm back in the garage on a 93 degree morning. My time with useful consciousness in these sort of temperatures won't be too long, so I, rather than building, I want to share a quick video with regards to uh, something near and dear to the heart of the FPV hobby, and that's the Humble Flight Controller. Um, everybody's built a handful of these things up, I'm sure. I've done more than uh, one or two. Um, but Something that I've differed in with a lot of people, I know a lot of guys uh, solve for minimum weight, and I'm not saying weight is not an issue. Weight absolutely is. The challenge is the flight controllers are one of the most expensive things and one of the most delicate things you're going to put into your airplane. And a lot of folks tend to simply glue them to the, uh, glue them to the floor, which, you know, that's something you can do, but at the same time, given the tools and tech that we have, maybe there's better ways to do it. That's why early on, and I mean, when I say early on, um, this is one of my earliest, well, early on, I can put it out this way. I started off with CC3Ds and I actually made some fixed wing stuff for that. After that, I moved into um, quad flight controllers uh, that I was repurposing and using for, uh, for fixed wing stuff. Um, I built my fair share of quads. Uh, I enjoy my quads, um, but I don't know, fixed wing just appealed to me more. I got into the 3D printing thing, as you well know, and 3D printing and flight controllers it's a, they're tools and tech that blend together nicely. Um, I forget the actual make of this board, and honestly, I keep a lot of these, but you can see here that I've incorporated with it a, um, there's a, a BEC, you got your GPS. Uh, I'm running one of the old ELRS, that's the, uh, the with the little tiny tower antenna. Um, you can see those, uh, the ceramic tower antenna. This was an early flight control board that I used in, in um, I don't know, in some project at some point. Um, it's kind of regaled back to uh, a museum piece at this point. Uh, later, I got into the uh, F411s. Um, here's a pair of those that I built up. Same thing, I like the idea of an all-in-one unit. Um, I wanted to have, if possible, you know, here you've got that same thing, the ceramic tower block antenna. I've got my GPS mounted up here. You simply had your uh, your power from the battery coming in and your power out to the ESC, and this was the ESC connection. Um, I wasn't too wild about the soldering points and my early solder jobs, hell, even my later sol solder jobs on a bad day aren't too fabulous, but I really did not like with, uh, with the 411 boards with Maytech that they made you solder to floating pins for your ESCs. That was something I always felt was a, with, was a drawback. Now that said, I had plenty of these guys that I built up. Um, later, as I went through a phase and I got into uh, some of my twin engine designs, here's one out of a crash. Um, you can see the reason for these 3D printed mounts uh, was that it was easy to mount these XT30s and the XT60s, for example, and it simplified some of the wiring. In the event of a crash, the whole purpose of this, the impact was taken by the mount itself. You know, it stood a better chance rather than ripping these solder pads out of, you know, like for example, this 405 with a tug on the wire. When that battery, when the airplane comes to a stop and this flight control board, which is glued to the airframe, comes to an immediate and sudden stop, the battery is gonna keep going. And if it rips those solder pads out, which those solder pads are, are never designed to be, uh, you know, structural in any way, if it rips those solder pads out, you're done. Your flight controller, and I mean, back in the day, those things were not cheap. So, you know, I tried different styles, different strategies for strain relief. Um, this was an earlier version, uh, and, it, and it worked. Same thing, another all-in-one unit. This had a, a separate breakout for, I believe that's actually an R9 receiver, um, and I used that. Uh, I showed you this was a design for a twin engine. Um, this was obviously, uh, well, not obviously necessarily, but when you think about how this would lay in the fuselage, this would sit typically just aft of the center of gravity. Um, the battery was here, so the front of the airplane was up here, so you'd have the battery here. These two were broken out in this direction so they could go out, it was a twin. Um, you know, and you've seen my twins in the background of some of my video. Um, so this flight controller was used in one of those. I've had a bit of a change of heart and this design evolved um, mainly because these solder connections are pretty tight and pretty small. And at some point I wanted to have a little bit more room and I found that there wasn't a lot lost if I integrated a, a bit of a wiring jig into my flight control mount. Now bear in mind, this next board, this is a 50 millimeter wide board. It is the interior width of my fuselage. 
Uh, but same thing, this was for a tractor configuration. And I came up with this pin design. The idea behind the pin design is that I could put the wires in, orient them however I wanted, and I didn't have floating high current DC wires that could cause magnetic interference to my servos. You know, so in this case, my servo wires I had here and pulled them frequently aft back to the tail surface or out to the wings. And same thing, I had the DC power going to the motors here and the DC power coming in there. The purpose of this was to capture all of those high current DC lines and keep them low in the fuselage and away from the antenna and away from the GPS. You've noticed in this case, I've moved the GPS off the board and typically I float that high in the fuselage on a separate avionics rack. At the front end of the avionics rack, typically I put the GPS and at the far end of the avionics rack, typically I put my, uh, my Express LRS receivers. That's primarily what I'm using now. Um, and in many of my builds, you'll see I, I pull an Express LRS antenna external to the airframe. That's not something you necessarily have to do if you're building with foam board. Um, from, a, uh, from an RF perspective, foam board to GPS is essentially transparent. Um, you know, I, I've heard guys make arguments about this and, uh, you know, I'm too dumb to believe things I read on the internet. So my counter to that was I went out and I took a, uh, one of these flight controllers that I had built up and I, you know, waited to see time to fix and I killed it entirely. And so I'd have to go out and do another cold fix. And I literally put a box of foam board on top of this. And guess what? It had the same time to fix. So I don't think that the argument that the foam board is mitigating your satellite signal is the reason that you're uh, not receiving, you know, all the satellites of your hopes and dreams or that you don't have the RF connectivity in the range. I don't think you're gonna have that problem with foam board. Now, if you're building with carbon fiber, absolutely. Carbon fiber as we use it um, in aircraft is conductive. And, you know, as it's conductive, it can function as a pretty efficient radio cage. More recently, I've gotten into um, some of the pusher designs and, you know, with the pusher designs, there's, there's something different. When you think about it, you want to have DC power coming in from your battery towards the front. But at the same time, at the back of the airplane is where you're going to have the power going to the motor. So that's where I came up with this design. And I thought that was pretty clever and somewhat innovative. Um, it's hard to see here. But what I actually did was I used some uh, nickel strips. I used five millimeter nickel strips, and if I remember right, I cut them in, in, in half about, and then I surrounded those with Kapton tape. And you can just see them at the front here. You can just see where they're just tucking in. I'll try and point it out. You look right there, where they're tucking into the um, inside and underneath the flight controller, and they passed along the back to this XT30. This worked really well right up to the point that I was drawing high current and it crashed the board. I don't do it anymore. Um, it was, again, I, I liked the idea, but this wasn't for me. So um, I shifted away from the, uh, the Maytech boards um, and you know I've been getting more and more into the SpeedyB boards. I think the SpeedyB boards represent tremendous value. Um, and so my most recent build that I'm doing for uh, you know my pusher designs Again, I went back to my pin-based design, and this is off the most recent uh, flight control board that SpeedyB has out. This is, I believe, it's the F405 Wing Mini. Same thing, DC power in coming from the batteries, DC power going out to my motor here. My uh, control surfaces, same thing, they route from here back up, coming out mid-flight control board, going out to uh, the servos, and then I run a pigtail coming back for my uh, ELRS receiver and my GPS, which is a, uh, again, same thing. This will end up high in the foam board. Um, the, the minis, uh, consideration with that, there's no USB port. Unlike on, you know, the older series, that's the uh, F405 wing. Um, so I do simply load one of the, uh, the, the, the beeper and uh, USB cable uh, attachments. Um, and I glue that on the fuselage. Matter of fact, in my um, forward swept, or I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the planks that I'm working with right now, those mount and you can see the through holes. Here, I'll grab one. Um, doing some airframe design changes on this, but 
those pass-throughs exist just for uh, the data connection. Um, this is an airframe test piece. Not building that one up from an avionics standpoint, just making some uh, structural changes that'll be coming out with the next airplane, but you'll have a chance to see that soon. So it's just something to bear in mind. I mean, no harm, no foul. You mount your uh, flight controllers and just, you know, hot glue it into your airplane. Um, but I've been having tremendous luck and I'll continue to evolve my, uh, my flight controller mount systems. Uh, and again, you know, for the extra weight of a couple of, uh, you know, uh, DuPont connectors and a couple of uh, XT30 and XT60 connectors, when this airplane crashes, I pull this out in one piece and put all the pieces in. It's rugged, it goes together simply, it comes apart simply. I have good RF separation uh, for electromagnetic interference um, and things work out. One last thing to note, when you're operating with a mess of different flight control boards and you're swapping in between models on your radio, you gotta have some method to keep this straight. What I've come up with, and this comes back from a fixed wing, this is on my TX-16S, as you can see. I make these guys. Um, what it basically is, again, everything in my life is 3D printed or laser cut, it seems like. This is a, a mount that attaches to your antenna. And I'll show you, I've got several of these. At the top, it'll spell out, uh, for example, what type of, you know, this was a, a twin tractor FPV airplane running the Matek 411 WTE board. And there it'll spell out my flight modes, you know, things to remember, uh, you know, save commands and whatnot, arm switches, not, not a level auto trim. I don't know, uh, for other ones, that was a Speedy BF 405 wing running iNav, and uh, that was a narrow bodied V-tail airplane. And same thing, I'll just clip this on there. Uh, you can see that uh, my switch SE um, I had, for example, a cam disable function, so I could disable the camera. The reason being, on the DJI systems, a lot of those require an arm signal, and if I didn't want to build something up with a flight controller, because sometimes I just like a strict line of sight airplane, um, I was building Arduino-based uh, spoofers running, um, they would basically take a, uh, a signal input and generate an arming signal that I would then convey to the, uh, to the DJI input and the DJI would see it as an arming signal received from a flight controller. Um, the downside of that is that, um, you know, you, it, it's another switch, it's a little added complexity, but the upside of it is, again, here in Phoenix, when you're waiting for a cold boot, say, of a GPS, and you have, you know, a couple minutes to wait, um, you could switch your camera off, and you're not starting off with a camera that's, you know, 25, 30 degrees C hotter than it was otherwise. You take that, you throw it in the air, you turn the camera on just before you toss it, and uh, she stays cool and you avoid any of the over, overheat warnings. This was uh, another one at 405 running RD Pilot 4.3. This is a twin tractor FPV. Same thing, timers, auto tunes. Um, there was different cam switches and you can see all my flight control modes just to show you that. Um, and then, a, oh, this is an old one. This is a forward swept uh, mini wing. We're running at a F411 straight. Um, yeah, flight data record. I had different battery modes set up um, and different, uh, that was an iNav build, different iNav modes. So, you know, it's just, it, it's just handy to remember how you have things set up when you get into a different aircraft. Um, I print these just on a, uh, on a label maker that I can, I used to, you know, as you can see some of these things, I mean, this, it looks like a battleship. There's about 10 of those labels that are, that are on there. Um, I no longer do that. I honestly just clip them into place and, uh, and leave them there uh, because I fly a bunch of different airplanes all with flight controllers. But if you're in the flight controller business, um, having notes that you can refer to in your FPV, um, and yeah, sure, on the OSD, you can display a lot of your uh, flight controller information, but while you're going through the basics and setting up and before you toss that thing in the air, it's, it's nice to kind of go back and, and touch grass with this and go over in your head where the, what switches are and what they do. Uh, particularly if you've said anything mission critical or somewhat unusual. So that's basically it. You know, same thing, guys. Uh, give it a like, give it a comment. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, you know, put uh, put your notes down below. Uh, let me know what flight controllers you guys are using or if, or if any of these things are stuff you have a vague interest in. If it's, if it's not for you, so be it. You know, I'll get back to doing airframe videos and, and building stuff out. Um, I have had some folks inquire about, you know, uh, selling these airplanes, you know, and it, it's something that, you know, I might come around to at some point. 
it's, it's honestly not my goal right now. I, FPV and, and RC is a community that's given so much to me freely. And this is something that I want to give back with sharing my knowledge and sharing experience. And, and, and I'm an idiot, trust me, half this stuff, you know, the only reason I have a thousand of these things is because I've crashed a thousand and one times. You know, I mean, anything, for example, marked with a zip tie like that means this board is just dead. It's basically a paperweight, but you know, I don't know. I think they're cool to look at and I still dig it. And that's why I leave these things built up. It's kind of memories of a happier day. Um, yeah, but uh, bottom line, you know, when it comes to selling these things, um, again, not at all my primary purpose. It's not to say that, you know, I, I might approach it at some point in the future. Um, in the summertime, candidly, when it's 95 degrees, you know, by uh, 7.30 in the morning in my garage, I am not interested in being here. You know, I came down here this morning at about 4.30 in the morning. I'll work for an hour or two. And after that, I'm out. Now in the winter time, when I can spend all day down here on my days that I'm off, oh, I love it. I sit down here and this is my happy space. I got my music going and I'm just cutting away like an idiot and building all kinds of things. Um, and I'd be happy at that point to, you know, maybe reach out and, and, and build some things for, for those of you that are interested in some of this stuff. Um, you know, there's there's been questions um, about, you know, it, it, again, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to do this for money. At the same time, you know, I know I've had folks that have approached and, and said, hey, I have a laser cutter and I'd love to, to make and cut these things. Um, I hate to say, but I want to reserve the right to, if I choose to sell these things in the future, I, I don't want to go into competition uh, with my own designs uh, from someone who didn't go through the, the, the bother of building them. Um, and I, I'm not against that. I started off as a guy with a laser and I started off by, you know, trying to copy designs that I saw that were successful and things that I wanted to make. Um, and that's how you learn. Uh, but what you learn is, you know, at the end of the day, you bring something to the table and you've got good ideas. So why not be the person to innovate? And I have so much more satisfaction in the things that I make and the things that I build, the things that exist nowhere else. You know, when you, when you make something like this and you hold it in your hand and you see it out performing a job, it's incredible. And I do want to share it and I do want to be part of the community. And right now giving back ideas, I think is the best way that I can do it because these tools are available. You can find a local makerspace, you can get out, you can buy a 3D printer for, you know, a hundred bucks or so. I mean, you know, Micro Center back in the day had the old $99 uh, Ender 3s. I had those things and I mean, they were phenomenal. I started way back in the printer bot days, you know, and I've been through, I don't even want to think about how many different printers I've got, but, um, you know, and it was, it was, I'm not running a farm. I'm not doing anything commercially with those things. It, it was just, I love these things that the tools available to us right now, it's a hell of a time to be alive. And especially in this hobby, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's like having a toy store in your garage when you can come up with an idea and you can just turn around and make it. I mean, you know, I don't know. Anyway, get out there, make something. It's a hell of a lot better than buying. It's a hell of a lot more satisfying. I appreciate your time. Leave any thoughts below in the comments. Otherwise, we'll see you again probably in a week.